All right, let's work another problem, at least one more from chapter three. This one's a little bit different than the other two I've worked. So in this problem, we have air, and the air is cooling. So we have a heat transfer out of the system. And as this air cools, this piston either moves to the left or to the right. We don't know yet. What we want to find from this problem is the work done. Is it done to the system? Is it taken out of the system? Is it positive or negative? Some assumptions we're making, we're, make, we're saying that the system is a closed system. We're assuming that this piston is moving very slowly during this process. So we're going to neglect acceleration. We're also neglecting any frictional forces. And we're assuming that the spring force varies linearly. So what I'd like to start doing here first is let me go ahead and draw a free body diagram of the piston here so we can get a better idea of the pressures acting on this system. All right, so here's the uh, piston body. So on the inside, we have a pressure on the inside of this chamber. This is a pressure times an area. On the right side of this, we have a force of the spring that's pressing on this boundary. Another force, so pressure times area is a force. So keep in, remember that a Pascal is a Newton per meter squared. So if we multiply the, pr the pressure by an area, we'll obtain a force. So the spring force acts to the left. We also have a, another force acting to the left, which is the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so this is our free body diagram. Now, if we wanted to describe how pressure varies in this chamber as the piston changes its position with time, we would use the force, and this is coming back from to uh, statics and dynamics. Hopefully, uh, you're either taking those or you remember what f principles used in those. In those classes, one of the foundational principles is F equals to MA. And I'm going to use vector symbols here on top of acceleration and force. Now remember, our second assumption states that this is a slow process, that we don't have any acceleration happening. So if we have no acceleration, A is equal to zero. So some of the forces acting on this free uh, body here are equal to zero. So basically, we have a statics problem. Now, if we balance the forces acting on this, and keep in mind this is the area of the piston for both cases. So this is area of the piston. I'll use a P to denote that. So some of the forces on this system are positive direction. And let me get my coordinate system here. So we have Y, positive Y, and positive X. So pressure times area of the piston minus force of the spring minus P atmosphere times area of the piston. And that's all equal to zero. If I divide all of these now by area of the piston, Divide this one by area of the piston. Divide this one. So 0 divided by area of the piston is 0 still. All right. So after dividing through by the area of the piston, we would have pressure is equal to, or I'm sorry, pressure minus force spring over area minus P atmosphere is equal to zero. And one rearranging one more time, we have pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus force spring over area of the piston. Okay, so here's our relationship for pressure. Now, the reason I did this 
and this may be more made more clear here is the reason I did this was because to define and to determine how much work is coming out of this system we are integrating the amount of work from points 1 to point 2 so if we integrate the amount of work and remember we're talking about this boundary work that's occurring our definition that we had put together last time was that if we integrate from V1 to V2 and this is P dV and you see here on the left hand side I use a delta symbol to denote that it's dependent on the process and here on the right hand I use a D is a derivative because it's a volume is a point function. Work depends on the path that it, that this process follows. Volume depends on the different points. So it's a point function and we use a D. All right. So if we expand this formula, what we get stuck with is in our previous example pressure was constant. Now pressure is changing as the position of the cylinder moves from one location to another. So how do we take into account that pressure change? Well, we just de derived or developed a relationship for pressure in this equation. So I'm going to substitute this relationship that we developed into this integral. So as I integrate from V1 to V2, I'll have pressure is equal to P atmospheric. And remember, this is pressure in the chamber plus force spring divided by area of the piston. And that's all integrated with respect to volume. And I draw my vo my V's for volume with a line through them because later in the class we'll be talking about velocity and that can get confusing. All right. So what do we do now? Well, in this equation here, we know what P atmosphere is. We're assuming it's 100,000 pascals. We know the area of the piston. We don't know the force of the spring because it's changing it's changing linearly so how do we determine how it changes linearly well let's go back and let's do some algebra to figure out how we can describe how it changes linearly so I'm gonna plot how the force looks with respect to volume here So we have volume on the x-axis, we have force in newtons on the y-axis. So at this point, point zero zero, and this is in meters cubed here, point zero zero two, and this is point zero zero three meters cubed. At point zero zero two, we have a force of zero newtons. At point zero zero three, we have a force acting on this of 900 newtons. This is all in Newtons. So our force varies linearly. The line may be, may be crooked, but I assure you that this is a, a linear change of force. All right. Um, at any given point on this line, we'll have an X point which is volume and a Y point that is force. So now you gotta really think back far to when you took algebra and we're gonna use the point slope formula to come up with an expression for how the spring changes the force of the spring changes linearly with the volume. So the point slope formula is this y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. Keep in mind here, y is our force. 
x is our volume. We don't know the slope. So let's find the slope of this line really quickly. The rise over the run. So the rise is 900. The run is the difference between 0 0.003 and 0 0.002. So that's 0 0.001. So that's the slope of this line. All right. So rewriting this. So let's go back. Rewriting this, this is going to be the force of the spring minus y1, which is 0, our initial point, is equal to 900 divided by 0 0.001 times x, which is our volume, minus x1 which is our initial point, which is point zero zero two. So finally, our spring force is equal to 900 over 0 0.001 times V minus 0 0.002. And this is our expression for the spring force, which we can now plug back into our equation over here. So doing that, we can now complete our integration or, or our uh, calculation of work. All right, so let me continue. So we've, def we've defined that work from 1 to 2 is the integral from v1 to v2. Of the atmospheric pressure. And now we can plug in our relationship that we developed for force of the spring. So this would be 900 divided by 0 0.001 times V minus 0 0.002 and this is all divided by the area of the piston which we can replace here with the actual numerical value so the area of the piston is 0 0.018 meters squared alright so What we can do here is start plugging in our numbers. Oh, and this is all integrated, sorry, with respect to volume. So this is P dV. All right, so work from 1 to 2, volume 1 to volume 2. The atmospheric pressure, remember, we assumed is 100,000 pascals. We're adding... Um, these values here so we have uh, let me distribute these values we have um, 900 times volume divided by 0 0.001 times 0 0.018 is 0 0.00018 and this is minus 900 times 0 0.002 divided by 0 0.000018 all right and we're integrating all of this with respect to volume all right what we will find out here after doing this is that this value here is equal to 100,000. So this value here is equal to this value here. You'll see we have a minus sign in front of that. So this will cancel with that. All right? So what we have, what we end up with is integrating between V1 to V2 
of 900 V divided by 0 0.000018 dV. Well, doing that, we can factor out the constant. Integrating the variable, we have V squared 2 over 2 minus V 1 squared over 2. Plugging in these values, this comes out to be negative 0 0.00000. 25. And let's let's look at the units here too, just to make sure we have the right units. So the units of that are in this bracket here are going to be meters to the sixth. The units of units of this denominator are going to be meters to the fifth, right? Because we had um, you can track that back up here. And 900 is going to be newtons. Um, you can track that back up to where we were uh, earlier. Let's see uh, this point zero. So this point zero zero one, remember, was volume, which was meters cubed, and this is 1800 meters squared. So that's how we get meters to the fifth. All right. So um, we have meters to the sixth. This cancels out with all but one of these, and we have a Newton meter. All right, so our work from one to two, carrying out this calculation, you guys can see it's going to be negative 125 joules. So what does negative mean? Negative mean it does work. on the air. As the air cools. So now I think it gives you a more full picture of what's going on. So we have here um, a piston that is cooling and as that piston as the air in that cylinder cools the piston moves to the left and that's that spring acts to compress that air more does doing work on that system as it cools and that volume inside of that chamber continues to uh, decrease now uh, what happens if we added heat to the system well we could have the opposite effect okay we could have if we added heat to this air we could um, move that piston to the right uh, and that may be another problem that you can think about too if we heat the system how much work would it do if it moved the same distance would it be equivalent to 125 joules but in the other direction so think about that maybe you can work that problem out um, I think in the next lecture what I'll be covering and start to talk about our thermodynamic properties. So I'll be introducing where uh, we get values that are located in the tables given in thermodynamics in the back of your book. And that's really going to be a key to a lot of different things that we do, looking at being able to look up what the specific volume of something is, what the internal energy of something is. We'll be able to do that.